<laughs> All right. Uh, counting matters. We've had a request to move 5.9 to number one and 5.3 to be heard second. Any other requests? Speak now or hold your peace. All right. 5.9. Treasure tax collector approve a budget adjustment. The fiscal year 17 18 in the tax. Um, Treasurer Tax Collector Department increased salary and benefits by thirty-four thousand one hundred and twenty. Prior period expenses by one thousand four thirty-three, and transfers in by fifty thousand, and decreased revenues by thirty-nine thousand six one four. Services and supplies by eight five one eight, and interfund expenses by five hundred dollars. Approve a budget adjustment for seventeen eighteen in the Contingency Fund Department. Increase appropriations for contingency by 16149 Approve a budget adjustment for fiscal year 1718 in the tax collector fund for cost department. Uh, 8638 Increasing transfers out by 50000 Increase to the general fund appropriations at 26535 Current balance in contingency fund is 16807 Contingent on Prior request being approved and current cash balance and tax collector fund for cost fund 638 is 179,191. What's that mean? Good morning. <laughs> it means it's been an interesting year for us. So uh, basically what you have before you is, um, I gave a lot more detail in the staff report, but it's been kind of an unprecedented year for us. We've had um, quite a few things that came up over the year that, you know, we always try to do the best that we can to um, work with what we have. Um, and we uh, try to do our best not to complain. I always feel just complaining. always just all that basically does change people's opinion of you. But this year, it was basically out of our control. And I tried to lay that out for you in the staff report to make you aware of all the things that were outside of our control that contributed to be coming before you to make this, this budget adjustment. Um, and that's why I'm here today to make you aware of everything that we went through to lead us here. So. It's very clear, thank you. All right, any questions? Um, your summary was amazing, and I want to thank you for that. And I, I see some systemic problems that would be rolling over to next year as well that you had talked about, and I would just encourage you to um, if somehow we can be pre proactive and get in front of some of those things. I know health we can't, but I want to commend you that this, you in your summary, you say this is the first time in 10 years that you've been before the board with an adjustment like this. So that's to be noted and congratulated. Thank you. I've not asked for contingency funds before, and I've mentioned that to the budget committee and made them aware of my concerns, and I do feel that there's going to be an, an issue and there is um, going to be some staff that's going to be on extended, extended leave, and um, some of those things are going to affect the general fund and, and your discretionary dollars. So that that will be impacted this year's budget. So, so I do have some concerns. Any comments from the public? With that, we'll bring it back and entertain a motion. Move to approve 5.9 as presented. Second. All right. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, same thing? All right. Five. All right. 5.3, approve budget adjustment for 1718 in the contributions to other fund department, increasing transfers out by 4,184. Approve a budget adjustment for 1718 in the Contingency General Fund Department, decreasing appropriations for contingency by 4184. Approve a budget for 1718 in the Emergency Service, OES, increasing revenues by 36329. Service and supplies by 30,318. Fixed assets by 16,496 transfers in by 4,184 and decrease interfund expenses by 1,852. 
increase in general funds appropriations of 4,184. Current contingency balance is 33,338. Contingent on prior request being approved and current cash balance emergency service fund is 137,468. Um, this budget adjustment is based on the management of the OES grants that we had. Um, we discovered that there were some interfund expenses that were not covered through the grants, um, and so that, that made us have to look for the contingency general fund. Um, moving forward, we are making arrangements that these expenses are going to be direct charge because the issue was if the expense is not just directly to the OES department, it could not be shared with other departments. So interfund expenses are not allowed. So we are making arrangements to not have that happen again. Uh, for example, internet service. That has to be a separate drug charge to OES. So um, again, this is a one-time request, and it should be able to allow us to close out the year in a balanced manner. Okay, any questions? Okay, I'll turn the public. Okay. Come That's back. So moved. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. Okay. Go out there and help everybody. <laughs> okay. 5.1, approve a budget adjustment for 1718 in the elections department, increase interfund expense by 10,487, approve a budget adjustment 17, uh, for fiscal year 1718 in the contingency general fund, decreasing the appropriations for contingency by 10,487, increase, increase general fund appropriations of 10,487, current balance for appropriation for contingency is 60,825. Morning. Morning, um, these were unanticipated costs due to court cases. This is why we're asking for um, more contingency money. Okay. Any questions? Okay, open up to the public. Graves from Lewiston. Um, reading the backup material, uh, I understand that it seems odd that if you have an election contest against uh, that you actually sue the candidate and not the person that ran the election. And that seems to be something that's written in your backup material that you might want to clarify or find out whether that's correct or not. Because it seems odd, but that's the way the court does it. The other thing is all of these costs are borne by the taxpayers in this county, me being one of them. Um, not only do I have a direct stake in it because I have to pay for the court costs, I have a direct stake because I am a voter. All of these could have been alleviated. We shouldn't be paying all this. Um, that there were simple remedies and they weren't taken. It was the obstinance and I don't know what it was with uh, not uh, correcting errors. A lot, bo both of these were errors that could have been corrected. I'm sure if we used Mr. Finley's money, they would have been corrected in August. But we're using, no, I'm talking about what's in the backup material and on your um, uh, cover sheet, what's written there. And these things, um, <laughs> we're, we're paying for these, and they should have been cleared up. They can still be cleared up, and that's what you need to do instead of taking more of our taxpayer money. Thank you. Uh, Jay Grossman from State Fork. Uh, I'm going to have to forgive my ignorance, but I had this, uh, I heard mentioned that this increase was from unforeseen court case costs. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. uh, is that just having to do with this whole voter thing, or is that with unforeseen court case costs overall in Trinity County? It's just the voters. Okay. Any 
Any other public comment? Diane Richards, Hayfork. Um, basically, you're throwing good money after bad here. Uh, the elections office should be cooperating rather than using the county council as a firewall. Most of the um, items that are asked for are public records and they're fighting to not get public records. Um, in the, also, if the election office had run the, the election the way they're supposed to by the law, there wouldn't even be an election contest, etc. There would not be legal ramifications. But they refuse to cooperate with um, even the uh, Republican uh, Central Committee. They refuse to cooperate with the observers putting themselves in this position. If they had cooperated, they would have um, been advised, you know, follow the law, do this or that. And that would have helped them. Instead, they completely ignore the public and have gotten themselves in this position. And so now you're going to give more money so that they can fight the public trying to make the election correct. And that's what we're trying. We, we contacted you. I know uh, Chair Gross came in and we said, look what they're doing. They're not letting us observe properly. You saw it with your own eyes. If they had cooperative, cooperated, it would have avoided all this, but they didn't. Instead, they decided to ignore election law. And you're just going to give them more money in order to fight the public getting documents. That's what we're trying to do is get the documents be able to see the things that we are allowed to see, observe as we're allowed to observe. This is what it's all about. And you're continuing to throw good men money after bad. Any more public comment? All right, we bring it back. Looking for a motion. I'd like to make a motion under clerk to report her assessor to approve 5.1 as presented. And she recused. I'd like to make a subsequent motion. We don't have a second. Second. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Subsequent? I would like to um, request that we send this to the Attorney General to be clear on the fact that we can, as a board, spend this money in this way with the public funds. I agree. Um, do we have a second? Well, not until we have a second. Okay. Subsequent dies. Margaret, are you are you trying to say something or? Nope, I'm just looking. Okay. All right. With that, please. Uh, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Aye. Passes four to one. All right. Five point two. Approve a budget adjustment for FY seventeen eighteen for board of supervisors, increasing. Uh, Service and supplies by 17,000. Approve a budget adjustment for 1718 contingency <coughs> general fund department, decreasing appropriations for contingency by 17,000. Increase in general fund appropriations of 17,000. Current balance for appropriations for contingency is 50,338. Contingent on prior request being approved. Upon that reading, I would like to request excuse myself. Okay. Thank you, sir. We can call you back in when we're done. Thank you. All right. Jim Grossman of the board. Um, in our original uh, budget hearings from 1718, amount of 15000 was assumed to be able to cover cost, and uh, it has not been able to cover the cost, so we're asking for the 17000 that came out of last time, and we pulled it because we knew there was going to be a few more dollars involved. So at this time, uh, they're requesting $17,000 to cover attorney costs for the Penny Finley case. Okay. Any questions for staff? Wrapping up. Margaret, do you have an answer for that? 
Well, we do not follow on active litigation. Um, I can talk to the board members specifically or, or privately if they have any questions about litigation. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Okay, any further questions? Open it up to the public. Diane Richards, Hay Fork. Okay. What you're doing and what you have done, you're up to 140000 on this case, um, is a crime every time you make a payment. It is a felony. That's Penal Code 424, Misappropriation of Public Funds. Um, there has now been filed a case against this to get an injunction against what you're doing. It's in the court right now. They're finding a judge for it. Um, and we will prevail because of a co uh, California, besides the Constitution, but there's a California Supreme Court case, Danson versus Mott, and it says that um, a public agency may not expend public funds to promote a partisan position in an election campaign. The court noted a fundamental precept of this nation's democratic electoral process is that the government may not take sides in election contests or bestow an unfair advantage of one of several competing factions. A principal danger feared by our country's founders lay in the possibility that the holders of the government authority would use official powers improperly to perpetuate themselves or their allies in office. The selective use of public funds in election campaigns, of, of course, raises the specter of just such an improper distortion of the democratic electoral process. That's what, why we're going to prevail and why you're going to be in trouble. You need to, every payment you make is actually a felony. It's a count. You need to stop it. You need to come to the table and say, okay, we were wrong. You can go to the Attorney General, but the Attorney General has already ruled on this um, before. I think it was in 1990. You cannot do this, and you're continuing to do it. We've told you several times. We brought it up. You've been on public notice. Now you're in court with us. Any other public comment? Okay, with that, we'll bring it back. Does anybody have questions for Margaret? Margaret, do you have any comments? Again, we don't comment on active litigation. I would, of course, caution both sides not to attempt to influence or uh, intimidate uh, defendants or plaintiffs in cases, um, and remind the board that on um, budget adjustments, it does require uh, forfeit votes. Okay. And if the board were to deny this, it would uh, constitute a breach of the contract with the uh, retained attorney. All right. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. I'm looking for a motion. Um, I make a motion to approve 5.2 as presented. Second. I'll make a subsequent motion that we um, refer this to the AG requesting his input on whether or not this is legal. don't have that, that dies from um, a lack of a second. I will point out we have had legal counsel on this. Um, so just for the record, we'll do a roll call. Supervisor Morris? Yes. Supervisor Mines? Yes. Supervisor Chabot? Abstain. Supervisor Groves? Uh, yes. It uh, is defeated. So we will come back and see what we can uh, see what we can do. For more clarification, uh, I will have to confirm, but I do believe an abstention and this constitutes constitute an I. So, but let me let me confirm that and come back to you. Okay. Will you do that today or later on? I'll do it right now. We're working with you. And then by then, I will let the CIO know for me. Okay. Y'all need to make more. Don't want to ask you to be removed. Please keep it down. All right, on to 
uh, excuse me, 5.4. Adopt a resolution which establishes non-represented management classification salary and benefits, effective July 1st, 18. Approximately 4,166 for FY 2018-19. And would somebody please ask Mr. Finley to come back in? Section 43.1 pertaining to commercial cannabis micro business license introduced July 17th, 2018. Okay, thank you. And is that for the following item also? Yes. All right, thank you, Mr. Myers. Last, last time. Yeah. 
Yes, go ahead. Um, the, the new maps, I didn't see them in the back of Well, the, the location where it says, and it's like Mount Diablo, and it gives latitude and longitude, but I did not look at, do you have the maps? That's, that's the Buckhill subdivision, and we did not include, a, we not included a map. Um, it's just been the legal description of the Buckhill subdivision. Okay. Um, that could be created. Yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, so just the roads that were very specific to the subdivision okay. that were created. I understand now. I just didn't. I haven't seen that before, and I didn't know if it was a new location. Thank you. I'll, I appreciate the I'll send them to you. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? No. All right, we'll open it up to the public. Kevin Manassi and Hayford. Thanks all you guys. Wow, this baby's loud today. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, my biggest concern, I want this to go through, but we need to do it fast, and I don't know. Um, got notice from the BCC and the CDFA, um, all the temporary licenses. If you don't have your temporary state license by the end of this month, you will not be able to get an extension for the 90-day extension at the end, because if your temporary license expires after the first of the year, you're going to have to be ready then. You're not going to get that other 90 days. So. I'm wondering if there's a way we're going to be able to get a temporary license issued to us from the county like in the next week or couple days so we can get our state one before the end of the month. Otherwise, we're getting short at 90 days to get to be in full compliance. Um, I know we got a temporary from the uh, cultivation this time, not a provisional. If we can get the same thing or even an authorization to proceed at the state level, we got to have our state temporary by the end of this month or we're short at 90 days. So we've already been held back seven months on this for this year. Everybody else got to start at the first of the year. Only other question I have, if this is going to come back for some work soon, um, there's a thing in there, we can only have six customers per day, week as a micro business in there. Um, I don't know what business can operate with only six customers coming around a week. Anyway, thank you very much. Matt Hawkins, Douglas City. Um, I was also. I would like to strongly urge the board to consider unclassified, also with for the manufacturing arm of a micro business license. I know you guys have said you're going to send it back to the planning commission for rural residential, right? Uh, why not unclassified as well? I don't see a huge difference in that. I think it's absolutely vital for a small farmer such as myself survival to be able to vertically integrate and make our own water hash. You know, we're talking about mesh bags and ice water and cannabis. This is not dangerous. If I can run in a woodworking shop in my garage, then I think I should be able to process my own water hash too. So please, please, please consider unclassified when you send that back to the planning commission. Thank you. Jake Grossman, Crest, Hay Fork. Uh, I would urge the board, um, and I think specifically the C CAO, <coughs> uh, to figure out whatever the heck we have to do to get this stuff passed. As, as you've heard, you know, the state feels like they've given ample time for everybody to come to the table. Um, when micro business farmers uh, or other folks with a, a, a huge amount of different issues having to do with the county go to the state and say hey this is the business model we're going to do we're working towards it there's things out of our control to hold up the state has kind of lost their smiley little face of being like oh we understand you're trying to come in they're at the point now where they're saying you've had plenty of time when you tell them it's out of our hands it's planning it's supervisors it's the county it's whatever I'm not pointing any fingers at specific people but whatever it is the state's like kind of well sorry and I understand that happens on a local level too where the planning department has people that aren't genuinely trying to move forward with things and they've gotten to the point that they're saying well sorry but we gotta figure this stuff out I you know I don't know if it's do away with this ordinance put a cap on it 
take a fee so that the county still is getting a fee and let the state regulations ride and let us follow state regulations, we can drain the swamp, I mean, not the swamp, sorry, the planning department. We could drain the planning department. We could move forward and have farms operating here. Like, I am, you guys have heard me talk for years now, and I am truly at a loss of words of how to describe what is going on out here. And now we're sitting here essentially taking the smallest farmers in our county, which are beyond the smallest farmers in our state, we're just kicking them in the mud right now, kicking them in the mud. And getting through this, you know, the, the county stuff is just a, 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 a tiny hurdle to what we have to do with the state. And now we've got guys that are facing, and girls facing, not being able to get extensions for temporary license from the state, not being able to, and now that the market's opened up, or we can actually, if we work with somebody out of our county, we can actually legally sell our product that goes into a tax base that helps our state. But it just feels like that's physically impossible here. Thank you. Uh, once again, John Brower from Junction City. and. Uh, yeah, there's a couple fatal flaws in this ordinance as written. I, yeah, it's it's good that it's going to get sent back to the planning commission to consider rural res for micro business, but <clears throat> all along the way, as these other license types have been bouncing their way through the planning commission, each time that rural residential or unclassified these other zoning types have been brought up for these essential commercial cannabis license types, manufacturing, distribution, obviously the two most important right now. Um, each time we were told, well, that'll come with micro-business. Only it hasn't come with micro-business. The conversation got hijacked into uh, uh, cottage industry and during two planning commission, two really important planning commission meetings got wasted trying to cram this subject into our existing cottage industry ordinance, which is a great ordinance. <clears throat> but it is vital that the mom and pops that are out there doing this right have a shot in this thing. And to keep them from participating as a micro-business just doesn't make sense. We've got to open it up to these other zoning types. And to, to say that, well, you can only have manufacturing, a manufacturing license type operate as a micro business um, if it could already qualify as a manufacturer like as currently written the for a participant that has the right zone property to be a micro business well why would they when they can already become that full license type it just I only know of one single cultivator in the county that is interested in the micro business as currently written. Only one. That's a travesty. This could be a great fit for Trinity. It really could. So we've got to open it up to these other zoning types. Of course people need to be able to make hash on their cultivation site or what would be a manufacturing premises in association with their cultivation site. We're not talking about volatile solvents. We're talking about perfectly safe, insane manufacturing methods that can easily find a safe home in a rural residential setting. It's already going on. And so I encourage that to be taken seriously and incorporated into this. Thank you. Welcome back, Liz. Thank you. Good morning. Liz McIntosh, Junction City. You know, I agree with all these comments that have already been said, and if you've got to pass something to pass something and make it a full-on ordinance, then move forward. That said, I would highly encourage you to really, really consider some of the other comments out here today. Write an ordinance that does go to the state. Take your fees. We've waited three years, and it's killed most of us, me included. So all these small people, like creating a narrow pathway is wonderful in some ways. There is a pathway, we can say that but it's so narrow that most of us has fallen off and then it leads many of us 
to start thinking if that's not the intended goal. And so we're hurting ourselves. We look at the car fire, we want to like support tourism and that kind of thing. And one thing I've learned, I already knew, but learned that we can't depend on the weather for our economy. We can't sink everything into tourism. We wrote those beautiful policies about doing this in a way that supports tourism and like these micro business guys only getting six people out there or doing, I don't know if that supports tourism and that kind of thing. And, and I just would like to see us have some kind of real economy and the state has made it hard enough. But what's been going on at the county level, and I know you guys are conflicted, I know you've got a lot of people battling it out and still the moral battle rages on, but we're wasting away. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, we'll bring it back to the board. So I just want to clarify, I don't believe we talk about customers, we just talk about employees. <clears throat> Is that correct? Yeah, because you're not allowed to have retail it's, customers yeah, at this We haven't time. done retail yet, so the customer portion is not part of this micro business. I think it's on 530. It's um, under F2. The micro business does not generate more than two non-employee vehicles visiting the licensed premises at any one time, or no more than six non-employee vehicles per week. It doesn't call them customers, but it, it, that, if you're the retail person, that would mean that you are only allowed to have six customer in a week. So that's why they said it. Okay, thank you for that clarification. That is not the intention. So do we need to make that a little more clear? Well, they don't have the ability to sell at the facility, so they're not customers. Yeah. But they could at a future date. Right, and that will be a retail license. It's wrapped up in that. It's part of it. Should there be a definition of customer? Or is there one of the definitions? Not at this time, because we don't have one. It's a non-storefront retail right. is the only portion of the micro. So may I ask a question? Is this anywhere in the BCCs or any other cannabis regulations, or is this specifically for training County? That was entirely generated from the planning commission. I, I missed your question. If this, if this ruling was in any other regulation, a BCC or a counter regs, or it, there's multiple agencies now, or if this was a standalone from training County, it's a standalone from training County. The, which part of it? Um, F2. Okay. Of this uh, yeah, that's in our zoning ordinance too. That that's been trying to manipulate through the uh, home cottage. And if everyone recalls from months ago when this was first introduced, the retail portion at, at the moment only applies to non-storefront retail. So when we go to do retail in its entirety, we will look at that aspect of customers coming to your place. This, at the moment, in order to have some retail component, is just stated as the non-storefront retail. Am I remembering that right? Because it's been yes. That's ago. not how my recollection is. So the micro business is a standalone license that incorporates multiple things that someone can do. It should not be confused whatsoever with a cottage industry um, that Trinity County offers if you want to make salsa or bread to go to the the um, farmer's market. Micro business is specifically only um, advocating for cannabis uh, retail, cultivation, distribution, and there's one other one, a part of that, that you have to pick four of the five. Co our cottage industry laws that we established was to help people be able to generate from their kitchens mostly and gardens a, a pathway to uh, to get an income. Mm -hmm. The micro business and the cottage industry are two two separate things that I would like to see stay separate. Um, so I don't remember that in the past at, at all whatsoever. So the problem with, with what you're saying is is that actually stiffens the regulations. The, the home cottage was used through the, through the existing zoning ordinance to allow this to come into smaller smaller zones uh, without that then then we would have a real difficult time getting this to fit into a zoning ordinance 
When did we marry the cottage and the micro businesses? Because apparently I wasn't in that conversation. Uh, months ago, and it's been to the PC. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's, it's changed again. It's been somewhat reduced. Yeah, the PC streamlined it. They did a good job. When it came to them, we, uh, we had a little more cumbersome. Uh, and then they turned around and streamlined it to make it fit uh, much better. So that's been, I don't know. When we sent, it's got to be three or four months ago. Right. And we took some of the verbiage from cottage industry so we can tier it. So those who are very small, if they fell into a certain group of parameters, they would just only need a director's use permit versus having to make them go get a conditional use permit. At a certain level, then it flips over to the conditional use permit requirement. So some of those parameters were kind of framed or pivot off of the cottage um, ordinance just to have some clarification between the two levels. So not everybody in a micro business then is forced to do a conditional use permit. We try to find a, two levels depending on your size where you would need to go quicker path or a longer path? If I may, yes, please. when we were looking at the cottage industry, you had three levels. You had no permits, no use permits, director's use permits, and you full-on use permits. And the problem was, was there's, if we tried to apply that, then there's situations where you'd end up in a director's use permit where we were just tending on the or you need a full direct full use permit where we just tend on being the director's use permit and then there's a lot where we didn't get any permit where we want to have some sort of permit so what they did was they drew a line between director's use permit and full use permit and uh, that was the, using the spirit of the cottage industry they drew it but they took a lot of the connections out and put it to where um, essentially the, uh, where you switch from the use permit was based on number of employees and based on uh, uh, the number of hours that you had people, folks working out there. And that was where it triggered whether you were in a director's use permit or in a full-on use permit. So, so the, what we're hearing, and I think people are misunderstanding, that you can't have the two employee vehicles that the F2 that you stated. That's not true. What it says is if you generate more than the two non-employee vehicles, you then qualify, you have to go to a conditional use permit. Correct. So we're not saying you can't do it, we're saying that you have to meet a higher standard of, of permitting. So it's not stopping it, it's just if you're this X small, then you use a director's right. use permit. If you're this small, you have to go to conditional use permit. So it's it's essentially everything needs a director's use permit unless you're a certain size. Then it's bigger than you need a start public car. Um, is it not? Um, Someone's going to have to remind me. It is. Where at. I've waited years for the moment a conversation like this ensues during public comment. <laughs> okay. um, I'll, I'll give you a chance in just a second. Thank you. So the, the Planning Commission has talked about this marriage between the micro and the cottage. Um, I, I clearly don't have a recollection of us doing it. And so the cottage the whole idea of, of, of that going forward was to have the most minimum impact of um, the county being regulating. It was specifically at that time to help people literally get out food at farmers markets and, and, and even like from your own kitchen. Very limited. You had, to, you had to sign a thing saying you wouldn't have your dogs and your cats in the kitchen. If you got a complaint, then somebody would come. It was very, very 
not managed. And that, I think, is a good thing. I think government should leave us alone unless we're doing something wrong. The micro businesses are, are not those that is specifically cannabis. And to marry the two, it seems like what we're doing is we're trying to find the most difficult pathway for the cannabis community to go forward. And that's why they feel like these are obstacles. Because they are obstacles in their pathway to go forward. So, so, so your option here is we just go to a conditional use permit. Call it good. I mean, this is this whole thing is designed to make it easier. Um, and, and, and but if, if we don't want to use the home, we we just make it a conditional use permit and move on. And there's no cottage industry in there anymore. It was used as a structure guideline for us. So, and I'll give you an example. There's a common in there. Uh, G, which is about vehicle usage, if it's on a common driveway, that was actually something that was pulled out of out of the cottage industry and moved over there. But the the way this works compared to the cottage industry are two different animals. Um, we headed down. We started a little bit down that road, but we found out it didn't work, and so we broke off and went back to just either a use permit director's use permit or a conditional use permit and, and uh, what the size of your business is what dictated which one of the two you mentioned yet. Okay, since I'm told that we're still in public, I'll go ahead, Jay. <coughs> Jay Gross from Crest Hay Fork, again. Uh, so over two employee vehicles you need a CUP uh, or whatever the size differentiation is. Employee vehicles. Okay, so we have a new saying in Trinity County in the cannabis industry that it's not a CUP; it's a see you next year. Okay, Olivia's CUP was the first submitted for a Type Three. I still have not heard. I mean, at least Leslie stopped giving us dates. So. My guess is maybe next year we'll see it. We're pushing on like eight months now. That's like, I know that there are these restrictions in the way that our county has been set up. And I obviously wish that we had an updated general plan and everything could be hunky dory and great. And I get that we're working through these avenues. And especially yourself, Mr. Groves, you have way more experience with all of this and how it all works than I will ever have, hopefully. I really hope to never have the experience you're doing this. But we got to figure something out. Because if you're going to tell these, anybody who wants, like, essentially a successful micro business that's going to have more than just, like, two cars coming up, they're going to need a CUP. We farmed that out to a third party to allegedly expedite it, which is now, like, I can tell you, I'm not even planning on ever growing an acre in Trinity County. Doesn't mean I'm stopping trying, but it seems so asinine and, and there's no way it's ever going to happen. And now you guys are essentially telling people that if you want a successful micro business, you need to do that? That's like, for lack of a better term, insane. And you might as well just tell them to go out of business. Thank you. And thank you for letting me speak. May I, Chair? Yes, we're still in open. Uh, good morning, board, Chairman. Justin Hawkins from Hayport. Um, I also kind of have a lot of um, hesitation about the CUP process and the speed at which it's moving. And I think that that's a result of staffing and you know the enormous pressure that the planning department's under, and I mean the building department's under even more incredible pressure now, especially with the fires and getting over from Reading. So. Um, my hope, though, is that um, maybe the board, if it's their pleasure, and I, I think it's been discussed before, can find a way to involve the community at large with a steering committee, perhaps, that can kind of try and maybe address a lot of these issues ahead of time. And I only say that to save everyone trouble here. And there are people like myself who spend almost every mo moment of their life thinking about cannabis policy. So 
Um, I think that there's people in the community that would love to try and help, and maybe some of these issues could have even been rectified before. And I know that it's gone through the Planning Commission multiple times, and I appreciate the ad hoc's work. I'm just thinking that there could be more people involved. Thank you. All right. Last chance for public comment. Can't resist. I really think we have to do Lisa Barrow Hayfork. I really think that we have to be really clear about we, we got to make a shift. We started this process out deciding we were going to control and regulate. And I think we got to make the shift to incentivize. I think these businesses are dying. And I think we got to create, I don't know what the pathway is, but we got to change the mindset. We got to incentivize. We've already done a lot of damage, we've already lost a whole bunch of people. We got to shift. We got to get to incentives. Okay, thank you. Okay, with that, we're closed. Um, Rick, I, uh, the public did remind me of something I requested at last meeting that you're going to give the board um, an update on those CUPs. I know you, we, the ad hoc got one, but I think it's important to give the board so. Next meeting, can we, uh, in your board report, uh, make sure we have get that? Yeah, for fire free, I'll be happy to. Um, because there, there are a lot of questions why SHN isn't moving forward as quick as possible. So I'd like the board to hear the whole, yeah. just an update of where they're at, how many licenses are going through the process. We'll get that. For Thank you. you. Um, Going back to something that Kevin said early, and he's, he's mentioned it a few times, and, and Margaret, I think uh, when this was before the board, oh gosh, I'm going to say early May, and we thought this was going to be done by mid-June or so, um, there's this process of the state licensing. Um, and I think your comment to him was, and, and I think we've done this before, that people can apply for the state license um, as they're going through our process. Do you remember that conversation? That's hard to see her, of course. Is that a question for me, Judy? Yes, sorry, Margaret. I do recall that conversation, yes. So, you know, it's kind of a two-path forward. Um, Clearly, Kevin, if Kevin was to call the state for his micro business license and we're still processing, uh, he just is in the queue with the state, especially now that there's a new deadline for, for these temp licenses. So can you reiterate that for all of us? Well, I think that was a very specific situation, but the recommendation is, is as you're going through the process, specifically as you're getting very close to finalizing, um, that there is no harm in applying for the state license. What they do do is submit a document to us uh, where we confer with planning and other departments to make sure to see where you are and, and we can have that communication with the state to let them know um, some details if things are being delayed or things are going on that will keep you in that proper queue. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think those were my last two things. I think the confusion also uh, to my ad hoc partner and to the rest of the board is folks who want to you know, do small um, farming as opposed to somebody who wants to just full on do manufacturing in an industrial zone. Um, there is again this different kind of level of participation. So Leslie or Rick, when you are bringing this back to the commission, and by that I mean, I mean you're taking some aspect of manufacturing back to the commission as we discussed uh, and, and we'll go to this further when the item comes up but type S, RR, egg forest are you framing it in terms of its application through micro business like I don't there just seems to be a link that's missing for consideration like perhaps we're not going to allow straight on just sole manufacturing in RR 
there's a certain type of, I think it was type S, I mean, type six we were looking at that was mechanical, non-volatile, uh, small, type we, six under manufacturing. We were looking at a subset of type right. six to send back and, and talk about and that's gonna go back to the commission. Um, so I just wanna make sure the commission's understanding, you know, how it kind of links back into micro business. Um, and then, you know, the gentleman today brought up the issue about unclassified. We have a lot of cultivators in unclassified region who might want to do something. Well, I, I will say, you know, we'll listen to what they have, but it's called unclassified. That means classified. What did I say? No, it means unclassified should be all unclassified should be classified. Mm -hmm. Well, right. And so that's the easiest, and, and I know we don't have an answer to what to classify it to, but it's, it's not, it is, a, it is a real zone, but it's a zone that is in holding pattern to be put into another pattern. So, I mean, that's going to be my answer to that. Just what else? I mean, uh, shall we start talking about something else? Well, you're also? still in the room, so I, I, I appreciate that. Barely, absolutely barely. <laughs> appreciate that. So, this is the final reading. If, if there's any made changes made today, we'll have to go back to the first reading. Um, so, what is the will of the board? I move to approve as presented with those changes from last time, of course. Okay, this is a ordinance, so. Supervisor Chadwick? Aye. Supervisor Morris? Aye. Supervisor Finley? Yes. Supervisor Gross? Aye. That's what you guys have. I like to keep track of that. Okay. All right, 5.6, waiver reading and enact an ordinance amending Train County Zoning Ordinance 3.15 by adding section 343.2 pertaining to cannabis manufacturing introduced on July 17th. Okay, so this is the as we kind of alluded to last time, we, uh, we have are breaking out a subset in manufacturing that is going to go, that section is going to go back to the Planning Commission. And that's for consideration of our, our Ag Forest um, and the Type S license. Did I miss anything, Leslie? No, they can talk about unclassified if they want. I mean, it's once and it opens can, up, they can, can talk about it. We can throw it unclassified at this point would be our suggestion. Other than that, um, it came as the first reading, um, including Ag Preserve. And was there any other real big changes we made? 2C, 2C. Sorry, yeah, 2CB. That, that um, it was not allowed in the car back. I'm sorry, you're right. But not allowed in the specified, specified and, but Carbon. this is the part of the process of taking hay fork out of the car belt, or car band or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> so that would be Cock Creek Train Center and Lewiston and Bucktail. Train Center in Lewiston, but it's just the historic district, and we're not in the cannabis 
cultivation curve. And that was it for the first reading. We send those other types back to PC. So this could move forward while those other little items get addressed at PC, which we hope would go before on September 9th. This is kind of the day we talked about. Okay, any other questions? All right, open up the public on this one. John, when you look around, that just means you just get it. <laughs> Gave you a chance to close it. <laughs> Good morning, once again, John Brower. Uh, the manufacturing bounced its way through the process, you know. Also, and um, I think to try to distinguish, the state has already done an excellent job of distinguishing between type seven and type six manufacturing. For us to further try to break that apart. It's just folly. It, it, it just makes us uncompetitive and kicks our people in the knees once again to tell them that, oh, you can do part of type 6, but you can't do type 6. Type 6 is type 6. I think to, to break it down even further into mechanical is just a mistake. Why can you not use CO2? In a in a you know other setting, it's already not available in rural res, but it should be type six. And um, the, so, the, go ahead. Go ahead and stop this time. So, so the answer on that is is that tr this would be not for the manufacturing, but under the micro site to allow. Right. The planning commission already said they didn't want ethanol extractions in rural residential. So this is saying, okay, you don't have that, but what about this? So it's to enlarge. We'll call you back when you're done, Jay. Um, enlarge what it can have. I, I hear you on that, um, but the once again, the, the, this this overlap between micro business and these other licensed types is really important. The devil's in the details, and to. To see, the whole time we were going through this manufacturing and distribution, we were told, oh, we'll look at micro business completely separately. And that is not, that's not what has happened. So I, I encourage some means of manufacturing on rural res, obviously. And I think the state has already done a great job of separating those types, type six and type seven. I think um, to uh, uh, to further limit Trinity folks is is just a mistake. Um, some ethanol is required for cleanup in any sort of hash making scenario, and um, it just seems like the state has already done this work for us. Um, the once again the conditional use permit process. Uh, um, has taken a while. The rest of the state's up and running. We're still talking about it. Um, all of our current cultivators have to work with an outside distributor, outside manufacturers. Um, and so I would really like to see this process streamlined and we would all love to hear an update from SHN um, on how they're doing on this. Um, I think uh, if we're relying on them for much of this heavy lifting, they should be in the room and be giving us frequent updates. Um, and uh, you know, I, I encourage the adoption of this ordinance. I encourage, I encourage you guys approving this ordinance today. It can help people get up and running, but it does need to be more inclusive. There's lots of different types of manufacturing, and the type six should be allowed in rural res. It's it's really important. Um, so instead of only sending the planning commission the option of approving mechanical concentrations, I think we should offer them the option of that or type six. It didn't really get properly sussed out at the planning commission 
this notion of type six and rural rest. Again, the conversation got hijacked that night and went down a completely different path. It's only got talked about for a few minutes at the end of a long night. And many of these long planning commission meetings um, end up late at night with everybody in the room frustrated and ready to go home and they're not really doing their complete work before handing you these complex subjects. In hindsight, it would have been great if we could have more of a workshop setting prior to the Planning Commission public hearings. And this stuff could get sussed out, I think, much better. But again, we're late to the game here, and I encourage the adoption of this today. As written, I think the Planning Commission should have greater options for manufacturing or rural res presented to them, not just mechanical. Morning, Chair, remaining, remaining members of the board. Um, I like the idea of, of trying to find a way to allow for manufacturing in different zones and this idea of the mechanical extraction being separated out. I just think that in, pre, in, in actual applications can be kind of tricky. And it is delineating from the original idea, I believe, as I recall, of all the cannabis ordinances to kind of mirror the state. And I think that there's a quite a bit of misconception about the manufacturing process and the whole stigma around the hydrocarbon in particular solvents. Um, ethanol kind of gets grouped in there, and I agree that it is somewhat volatile, although typically at normal temperatures, it's a liquid um, in the room. It's not a vapor, which is really where the danger is. But what I would say is though, is that the state has really gone over, and having read the state's rules on this, they're pretty strict about the type of safety mechanisms that you can employ with these extraction equipment. And I think that the state in, has gone over this quite a bit, and I think if the manufacturer is able to follow the state standards, safety can be ensured for the public in zones um, where it may not be perceived as being safe right now. And I was, I've been at the Planning Commission meetings also. The meeting this was heard, I think it got out after 11 p.m. Very long day, and I gotta tell you, everyone was exhausted, myself included, even though I'm not typically too exhausted after the meetings, but that was a long one. And they just heard a lot of different things. And if you have never been through the extraction or been around these situations, I think the misconceptions are easy to have, and the commission members just honestly they probably have never even seen these or really read the rules a whole lot so they really don't have a whole lot of like firm tangible things to work with and make the decisions so um, I think that you can have type 6 in different zones including possibly rural residential without endangering the lives and, and, uh, or safety of the public thank you Hey guys, don't give me that look, Keith. Come on now. I gave, on, you, I gave you like an 80 day vacation from me or something <laughs> like that. Um, Jay goes from Chris to Hey Fort. I got two parts to do with this. The first being the uh, facility I've talked about in here before um, that is one of the biggest distribution, cultivation, manufacturing facilities in the state of California, is about 30 minutes south of Salinas. Um, in a little town called Greenfield. It's the number one employer in that city. I believe it's the city, but we'll use that loosely. Uh, this facility is sandwiched, and I mean sandwiched, between the city. I knew she hated me. I knew it. <laughs> right? Um, it's sandwiched between the city hall and the police department. And I mean sandwiched like I could take the core of an apple and I could hit a police officer walking out of the front door from their manufacturing facility. Now they just had a catastrophic fire there in their cultivation facility. Um, manufacturing was safe. There was no huge explosion. There was no nothing like that. And this is literally sandwich. I'm talking fences are touching walls here. Uh, so I would love to see the misconception 
of, of all this danger. Um, that included, my family has a piece of rural residential land which wouldn't be allowed to do manufacturing in, except that it's 74 acres surrounded by SPI land. So like, don't really, I think there's better odds of a tree falling on me during a, you know, logging operation than me actually blowing somebody up. Um, the second part that I think is, is much more overlaying with all of this is that we're making these like not clear cut decisions and these like interpretations that have to come down through the planning department. And the one thing that I am more certain of at this point in my life than anything else is that the planning department has failed abundantly with interpreting, executing, and enforcing those interpretations. It probably is the single most biggest problem with our program. I can feel Leslie hating me right now. I just don't want to see another ball of this thrown into the system where now it's a whole other set of interpretations, a whole other set of, well, I think this, and we're not, I'm not just saying Leslie, because board, CAO, Leslie, Scott, everybody, Rachel, you know, and it just, it's like playing a game of telephone. <coughs> and we have to eliminate that, or none of this will be successful. And what I see is the, the way in these meetings where stuff theoretically, it's like, yeah, this sounds great, this is a great way to work through this, and we can move it this way and that way, it doesn't flush out that way. And we have to, I mean, starting today, we have to stop <coughs> that practice. Thank you. Anybody else? Step C in the Trinity County Probation Department effective September 1st, 2018. Approximate cost and salary and benefits per month for the deputy officer at uh, deputy officer one at A step is $55,737 per year. At step C is $60,102 per year with a difference of $4,365. Yep. 
Uh, yes, this was a recruitment for a, a deputy probation officer, one position that would either serve in the capacity of a school resource officer or backfill a seasoned officer to perform that function. We had uh, five applications received, one immediately screened out of the four remaining applications, uh, very limited uh, history of uh, community corrections work. Uh, there was one candidate on the panel which consisted of two probation management staff, one school district employee, and one out of county probation uh, administrator. Uh, the candidate that was chosen is an existing county employee, and uh, we would like to bring this individual into the department at their current pay grade with their other department. Okay, any questions? Nope. Any questions from the public? All right, with that, come back to the board. So moved. Second. All right, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. All right, so you got to sit and listen to all that fun. They're so fun. <laughs> okay, transportation. Approve a budget adjustment for 2017 18 in the miscellaneous public works department increasing interfund expenses by 29,526 and decreasing services and supplies by 17,179. Approve a budget adjustment for FY 17-18 in the contingency general fund department, decreasing appropriations for contingency by 12,347. Increase in general funds appropriation of 12,347. Current balance contingency fund is 29,000 Contingency general fund is 29,154 contingent on prior request being approved. Um, we do not budget for fires. The hope that we have no fires and we have to provide services for. Um, but uh, when we do have a fire, uh, the initial part of our, the fires usually. Our fires are usually big enough that they are covered under either an FMAG or uh, which is a fire management grant or a CDAA grant. But the problem is those grants pay for overtime and time above what you would have to work. The regular time is paid for by the county. It's essentially, you, they go with the assumption you have to be out there and do it. And so, um, You don't get reimbursed. There are some expenses that happen in, in the fire that uh, we can't build to the road department. If someone's manning a roadblock for a county road, I can cover that. But let's say they're manning it for a non county road that I cannot cover because uh, then I can only cover expenses that are two county roads. So in some of these disasters, we run into expenses that occur. Um, that we have to reimburse. And for instance, in this fire, we had 29, when all said and done, we had $29,000 in expenses. We were able to use mis, uh, some monies that were involved in miscellaneous public works for things that were identified, we just didn't do, such as like the inspection and stuff. And that's something we kind of commonly do when, when we uh, have to go and find money from other sources to offset the cost of the fire. And so we used up all the money that we could, but with the land fire, we still had $12,347 of expenses that could not be offset. And so with that, we're going to make a request for um, uh, uh, reimbursement. And again, um, going back to it, most of the expenses in the land fire were really related to manning the Dur Rock, which was the Disaster Recovery Center that dealt with the uh, bringing in people uh, to um, uh, that dealt with uh, the cow recycle and the removal of debris and everything. And all that time I couldn't build. Again, it's just like closing a private road. I cannot build. So, so with that I can answer any questions. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. Would some of these items uh, possibly have been covered by OES, HHS, from the description? 
The way I understand the disaster is the individual department has to cover what is not covered under the right. grants itself. So HHS and OES do not have a budget for DOT people to respond to a disaster. It's both within OK and budget. I'll buy that one then. So you do, so you will start looking at budgeting for some of this? Um, or will this be a continued non-budget? This will be a continued non-budget because, okay. you know, it's, it's for instance, the year before I didn't have anything. I had some expenses in, in uh, the 2015 fires, but they were more related to recovery and training center. And then I didn't have any expenses for a couple of years. So it's a hit and miss every year. I, I can tell you right now, this year I might have some, I will have some expenses related to attending the meetings over in Anderson and things like that. Um, but they should be fairly minimal. Um, but again, it's what we don't recover through the FA or the CDA grant that we have to find money for to cover at the end. Okay. Ms. Morris? So I don't think we had an FMEG for the Helena fire, if I remember that correctly. We, we did. did. Yeah. So this is uh, the portion that didn't get covered. Is, did I hear you right? Yes. Okay. It's, it's, it, FMEG only pays for overtime. Oh, uh, that's right. And so um, these other expenses just don't get covered under either grant. No. It's, hmm. it's, the, it's the problem that we have in the roads department. If it, the expectation of the state or agencies above us are that you're going to be working it anyways, therefore we'll reimburse it. But the problem is, is that the road is in a sense an enterprise. So in order to be eligible for reimbursement of road funds, they have to work on road specific items. Right. Oh, I see. I got you. All right. Thank you, Rick. That's that's what kills us. Is I send them the dirt off then on. Right. That I missed that point. Yes. Is there a way to include this in your job description so that we can start to receive some funds or use some of the other grants? Um, or is it included in your job description? You talk about your travel down to Anderson won't be covered. Um, Whether it was in my job description or not, it's it, the because your road salary. funds have to be specifically spent to activities and that to fund him. But I'm trying to figure out how to get the DOT into OES so we can access those grants or any way to, to access yeah, them. Think about right. it. Thank you. Okay. I'm done. Any public comment? On that, we will come back to the board looking for a motion. So made. Favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Same sign. Thanks, for Okay, so we are going to go back to Addendum uh, approve a budget adjustment for FY 2017-18 in the EMS hospital department, increasing contributions to other funds by $600. No impact to the general fund. Current cash balance in the EMS hospital fund is $4,239. Signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. 
Okay, uh, we are going to have to go back to 5.2. And uh, I assume you're going to accuse again. I didn't know that, but I sure will. Okay, this is from County Council uh, under the vote of um, Stain. I will read under authority of Government Code Section 25003, providing where the necessary I votes are one short of a majority of the entire board, and an Stain vote shall constitute concurrence with the I votes. Each member of the board is thus informed by the rule that he may in such a situation by either an I vote or an abstain vote. Or if he, and sorry. It's okay. I, I, it's, it doesn't bother me when I can be a he. <laughs> Cat state law, it's, I don't I, know. I don't mind. Okay, okay. All, right, all right. So I'll choose. He may vote <laughs> against the measure by a no vote in any of these events required under section 25005 that a majority of all members of the board shall concur for passage of the measure of satisfied. Dry Creek Valley Association versus Board of Super, uh, Supervisors, 67 Cal, APP 3D 539. Her count vote says the yes. And she recommends that she should be allowed to change her vote to a no if she cho so chooses. Actually, that's not correct. Okay, that's not correct? The second part is not correct. I believe only those that voted in favor have the opportunity to correct a no vote, uh, to correct their vote. We would have to do a reconsider. It would have to be by motion to reconsider. It's not eligible except for the except for as initiated by somebody who voted in favor. So it would have to be at the pleasure of someone who voted in favor for her modifying. Um. So we would have to. I, you lost me. I'm sorry. I want to get this exactly <laughs> right. I apologize. What? So what? It's for a motion to reconsider or a motion to amend, uh, that can only be done by someone who voted in favor of the motion that passed. Okay. So in this case, it would be only one of the three members that voted the actual I to do a motion for reconsideration, and then that, the vote okay. can be taken again. All right. So do any of the members that have voted I would like to reconsider the vote? Sure. Okay, so does it have to be seconded, Margaret, or just one person can say yes, reconsider? Well, it has to be seconded. I'm going to ask a question. So what are, what are you asking us to do? Because I'm a little confused myself on this. So um, in other words, you're asking one of us people that voted yes that we want to re-look into this vote, or we just go ahead with our vote and move on and we're done? So I, I, again, I'm not asking you anything. I'm just telling you what the, what the rules say. Uh, the rules say her vote as an abstain constitutes an I, therefore the provision passed. If the board, if at, at the board's pleasure, they would like to modify or change that vote, they have the option of doing a motion to uh, amend, and that needs to be initiated by an individual who voted in favor of it originally. Okay. Okay. I misunderstood as well. So, so you're rescinding? Right. Because I didn't understand. Didn't hear the first part. So I didn't understand. Okay, so we have no motion to reconsider. All right, so then it, it's a done deal. Is that right, Margaret? That is correct. Okay. So it passed. Very unusual. Yeah. I don't understand the law at all. Those are so I guess we all learned something today. I just want to be, for the record, it would be a no. And I, I think it's wrong, since all four of us did not know that, that I don't have a, um, an opportunity to say that. So for the record, my vote would be no. I think you're making a mistake. All I want to do is get permission from the Attorney General. So, OK, we're still not close. Yes? No, I, I'm just processing it. All right, we are going to go to closed session. Um, closed session, Government Code Section 54954.5E, Public Employee Appointment District Attorney. Any comment on that?
Okay, Eric, ready?